Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to read you two stories. One which I think was written more than 20 years ago, and the other was written only a couple of years ago. The older one comes first. It's called Teresa's Wedding. The remains of the wedding cake were on top of the piano in Swanton's lounge bar, beneath a framed advertisement for Power's Whiskey. Chas Flynn, the best man, had opened two packets of confetti. It lay thickly on the remains of the wedding cake, on the surface of the bar and the piano, on the table and the two small chairs that the lounge bar contained, and on the tattered green and red linoleum. The wedding guests, themselves covered in confetti, stood in groups. Father Hogan, who had conducted the service in the Church of the Immaculate Conception, stood with Mrs. Atty, the mother of the bride, and Mrs. Cornish, the mother of the bridegroom, and Mrs. Tracy, a sister of Mrs. Atty's. Mrs. Tracy was the stoutest of the three women, a farmer's widow who lived eight miles from the town. In spite of the jubilant nature of the occasion, she was dressed in black, a colour she had affected since the death of her husband three years ago. Mrs. Atty, bespectacled, with her grey hair in a bun, wore a flowered dress, small, yellow and blue blooms that blended easily with the confetti. Mrs. Cornish was in pink, with a pink hat. Father Hogan, a big, red-complexioned man, held a tumbler containing whiskey and water in equal measures. His companions sipped sherry. Artie Cornish, the bridegroom, drank stout with his friends Eddie Boland and Chas Flynn, who worked in the town's bacon factory, and Screw Doyle, so-called because he served behind the counter in Phelan's hardware shop. Artie, who worked in the shop himself, Driscoll's Provisions and Bar, was a freckled man of 28, six years older than his bride. He was heavily built, his bulk encased now in a suit of navy blue serge, similar to the suits that all the other men were wearing that morning in Swanton's lounge bar. In the opinion of Mr. Driscoll, his employer, he was a conscientious shopman with a good memory for where commodities were kept. Customers occasionally found him slow. The fathers of the bride and bridegroom, Mr. Atty and Mr. Cornish, were talking about greyhounds, keeping close to the bar. They shared a feeling of unease caused by being in the lounge bar of Swanton's with women present on a Saturday morning. Bring us two more big ones, Mr. Cornish requested of Kevin, a youth behind the bar, hoping that this addition to his consumption of whiskey would relax matters. They wore white carnations in the buttonholes of their suits and stiff white collars which had reddened their necks. Unknown to one another, they shared the same thought. I wish that the bride and groom would soon decide to bring the occasion to an end by going to prepare themselves for their journey to Cork on the half-one bus. Mr. Atty and Mr. Cornish, bald-headed men of 53 and 55, had it in mind to spend the remainder of the day in Swanton's lounge bar, celebrating in their particular way the union of their children. The bride, who had been Teresa Atty and was now Teresa Cornish, had a round pretty face and black pretty hair and was two and a half months pregnant. She stood in the corner of the lounge with her friends, Philomena Morrissey and Kitty Roach, both of whom had been bridesmaids. All three of them were in their wedding finery, dresses they planned to alter and have dyed, so that later on they could go to parties in them, even though parties were rare in the town. I hope you'll be happy, Teresa, Kitty Roach whispered. I hope you'll be all right. She couldn't help giggling, even though she didn't want to. She giggled because she'd drunk a glass of gin and orange, which Screw Doyle had said would steady her. She'd been nervous in the church. She tripped twice on the walk down the aisle. You'll be marrying yourself one of these days, Teresa whispered, her cheeks still glowing after the excitement of the ceremony. I hope you'll be happy too, Kit. They'd known each other all their lives. They'd been to the presentation nuns together. They'd taken First Communion together. Even when they'd left the nuns, 
When Teresa had gone to work in the medical hall and Kitty Roach and Philomena in Keene's drapery, they'd continued to see each other almost every day. We'll think of you, Teresa, Philomena said. We'll pray for you. Philomena, plump and pale-haired, had every hope of marrying herself and had even planned her dress in light lemony lace with a limerick veil. Twice in the last month she'd gone out with Des Foley the vet, and even if he was a few years older than he might be and had a car that smelt of cattle disinfectant, there was more to be said for Des Foley than for many another. Teresa's two sisters, much older than Teresa, stood by the piano and the framed Pa's advertisement between the two windows of the lounge bar. Agnes, in smart powder blue, was tall and thin, the older of the two. Loretta, in brown, was small. Their own two marriages, eleven and nine years ago, had been consecrated by Father Hogan in the Church of the Immaculate Conception, and celebrated afterwards in this same lounge bar. Loretta had married a man who was no longer mentioned because he'd gone to England and had never come back. <laughs> Agnes had married George Tobin, who was a present sitting outside the lounge bar in a Ford Prefect in charge of his and Agnes's three small children. The Tobins lived in Cork now, George being the manager of a shoe shop there. Loretta lived with her parents like an unmarried daughter again. Sickens you, Agnes said. She's only a kid, marrying a goop like that. She'll be stuck in this dump of a town forever. The Loretta didn't say anything. It was well known that Agnes's own marriage had turned out well. George Tobin was a teetotaler and had no interest in either horses or greyhounds. From where she stood, the Loretta could see him through the window, sitting patiently in the Ford Prefect, reading a comic to his children. Loretta's marriage had not been consummated. Well, though I said it before, I'll say it again, said Father Hogan. It's a great day for a mother. Mrs. Atty and Mrs. Cornish politely agreed, without speaking. Mrs. Tracy smiled. And for an aunt too, Mrs. Tracy, naturally enough. Mrs. Tracy smiled again. A great day, she said. Ah, uh, I'm happy for Teresa, Father Hogan said, and for Artie too. Naturally enough, aren't they as fine a couple as ever stepped out of this town, Mrs. Cornish? Are they leaving the town? Mrs. Tracy asked, confusion breaking in her face. I, I thought Artie was fixed in Driscoll's. It's a, it's a manner of speaking, Mrs. Tracy. <laughs> Father Hogan explained. It's, it's, it's a way of putting the thing. When I was marrying them this morning, I looked down at their two faces and I said to myself, isn't it great God gave them life? The three women looked across the lounge at Teresa standing with her friends Philomena and Kitty Roach and then at Artie and Screw Doyle, Eddie Boland and Chas Flynn. He has a great career in front of him in Driscoll's, Father Hogan pronounced. Will Teresa remain on in the medical hall, Mrs. Atty? Mrs. Atty replied that her daughter would remain for a while in the medical hall. It was Father Hogan who had persuaded Artie of his duty when Artie had hesitated. Mrs. Atty and Teresa had gone to him for advice. He'd spoken to Artie and to Mr. and Mrs. Cornish, and the matter had naturally not been mentioned on either side since. Will I get you another glass for father? inquired Mrs. Tracy, holding out her hand for the priest's tumbler. Well, it isn't every day I am honoured, said Father Hogan with a smile, putting the tumbler into Mrs. Tracy's hand. At the bar, Mr. Atty and Mr. Cornish drank steadily on. In their corner, Teresa and her bridesmaids talked about weddings that had taken place in the Church of the Immaculate Conception in the past, how they had stood by the railings of the church when they were children, excited by the finery and the men in serge suits. Teresa's sisters whispered, Agnes continuing about the inadequacy of the man Teresa had just married. Loretta whispered without actually forming words. She wished her sister wouldn't go on so because she didn't want to think about any of it, about what had happened to Teresa and what would happen to her again tonight in a hotel in Cork. She'd fainted when it had nearly happened to herself. <laughs> Be dad, there'll be no hold in you tonight, Artie, Eddie Boland whispered thickly into the bridegroom's ear. 
He nudged Artie in the stomach with his elbow, spilling some Guinness. He laughed uproariously. We'll be following you in two cars, Screw Doyle said. We'll be waiting in the double bed for you. Screw Doyle laughed also, striking the floor repeatedly with his left foot, which was a habit of his when excited. At a late hour the night before, he told Artie that once, after a dance, he'd spent an hour in the field with the girl whom Artie had agreed to marry. I had a great bloody time with her, he confided. I have a word with Teresa, said Father Hogan, moving away from Teresa's mother, her aunt, and Mrs. Cornish. He did not, however, cross the lounge immediately, but paused by the bar where Mr. Cornish and Mr. Ashley were. He put his empty tumbler on the bar itself, and Mr. Atty pushed it towards young Kevin, who at once refilled it. Well, it's a great day for a father, said Father Hogan. Aren't they a tip-top credit to each other? Who's that father? inquired Mr. Cornish. (laughs) His eyes a little bleary, sweat hanging from his cheeks. Father Hogan laughed. He put his tumbler on the bar again, and Mr. Cornish pushed it towards young Kevin for another refill. In that corner, Philomena confided to Teresa and Kitty Roach that she wouldn't mind marrying Des Foley the vet. If he asked her this minute, she'd probably say yes. Is Chas Flynn nice? Kitty Roach asked, squinting across at him. On the piano, Eddie Boland was playing Mother McCree. Listen, screw, Artie said, keeping his voice low, although it wasn't necessary. Is that true? Did you go into a field with Teresa? Loretta watched while George Tobin, in his Ford Prefect, turned a page of the comic he was reading to his children. Her sister's voice continued in its abuse of the town and its people, in particular the shopman who had got Teresa pregnant. Agnes hated the town and always had. She'd met George Tobin at a dance in Cork and had said to Loretta, that in six months' time she'd be gone from the town forever, which was precisely what had happened, except that marriage had made her less nice than she'd been. She'd hated the town in a jolly way once, laughing over it. Now she hardly laughed at all. Look at him, she was saying. I doubt he knows how to hold a knife and fork. Loretta ceased her observation of her sister's husband through the window, and regarded Artie Cornish instead. Dear Jesus, she prayed. Dear Jesus, help her. Sure, it was only a bit of gas, screwed oil, assured Artie. Sure, there was no harm done, Artie. In no way did Teresa love him. She had been aware of that when Father Hogan had arranged the marriage, and even before that, when she told her mother that she thought she was pregnant and had mentioned Artie Cornish's name. Artie Cornish was much the same as his friends. You could be walking along a road with Screw Doyle or Artie Cornish, and you could hardly tell the difference. (laughs) There was nothing special about Artie Cornish, except that he always added up the figures twice when he was serving you in Driscoll's. There was nothing bad about him any more than there was anything bad about Eddie Boland or Chas Flynn or even Screw Doyle. She said privately to Father Hogan that she didn't love him or feel anything for him one way or the other. Father Hogan replied that in the circumstances all that line of talk was irrelevant. (laughs) When she was at the presentation convent, Theresa had imagined her wedding and even the celebration in this very lounge bar. She had imagined everything that had happened that morning and the things that were happening still. She had imagined herself standing with her bridesmaids as she was standing now, her mother and her aunt drinking sherry, Agnes and Loretta being there too, and other people and music. Only the bridegroom had been mysterious, some faceless, bodiless presence beyond imagination. From conversations she had had with Philomena and Kitty Roach and with her sisters, she knew that they had imagined in a similar way. 
Yet Agnes had settled for George Tobin because George Tobin was employed in Cork and could take her away from the town. Doretta, who had been married for a matter of weeks, was going to become a nun. Artie ordered more bottles of stout from Kevin. He didn't want to catch the half-one bus and have to sit beside her all the way to Cork. He didn't want to go to the Lee Hotel when they could just as easily have remained in the town, when he could just as easily have gone into Driscoll's and continued as before. It would have been different if Screw Doyle hadn't said he'd been in the field with her. You could pretend a bit on the bus and in the hotel just to make the whole thing go. You could pretend like you'd been pretending ever since Father Hogan had laid down the law. You could make the best of it, like Father Hogan had said. He handed a bottle of stout to Chas Flynn and one to Screw Doyle and another to Eddie Boland. He'd ask her about it on the bus. He'd repeat what Screw Doyle had said and ask her if it was true. For all he knew, the child she was carrying was Screw Doyle's and would be born with Screw Doyle's thin nose. Everyone in the town would know when they looked at it. His mother had told him when he was 16, never to trust a girl, never to get involved, because he'd be caught in the end. He'd get caught because he was easygoing, because he didn't possess the smartness of Screw Doyle and some of the others. Sure, you might as well marry Teresa as anyone else, his father had said, after Father Hogan had called in to see them about the matter. His mother had said, Things will never be the same between them again. God go with you, girl, Father Hogan said to Teresa, motioning Kitty Roach and Philomena away. Isn't it a great thing that's happened, Teresa? His red-skinned face with the shiny false teeth so evenly arrayed in it was close to hers. For a moment she thought he might kiss her, which of course was ridiculous, Father Hogan kissing anyone, even at a wedding celebration. It's a great day for all of us, girl. When she told her mother, her mother said it made her feel sick. Her father hit her on the side of the face. Agnes came down specially from Cork to try and sort the matter out. It was then that Loretta had first mentioned in becoming a nun. I want to say two words, said Father Hogan, still standing beside her, but now addressing everyone in the lounge bar. Come over here alongside us, Artie. Is there a drop in everyone's glass? Artie moved across the lounge bar with his glass of stout. Mr Cornish told young Kevin to pour out a few more measures. Eddie Boland stopped playing the piano. It's only this, said Father Hogan. I want us all to lift our glasses to Artie and Teresa. May God go with you, the pair of you. May you meet happiness halfway. Noise broke out after that. Father Hogan shook hands with Teresa and then with Artie. He had a funeral next on the agenda, he said. He'd better go and get his dinner inside him. Goodbye, Father, Artie said. Thanks for doing the job. God bless the pair of you, said Father Hogan, and went away. We should be going for the bus, Artie said to her. It wouldn't do to miss the old bus. No, it wouldn't. I'll see you down there, so you'll have to change your clothes. Yes. I'll come the way I am. You'll find the way you are, Artie. He looked at the stout in his glass and didn't raise his eyes from it when he spoke again. Did Screw Doyle take you into a field, Teresa? He hadn't meant to say it then. It was wrong to come out with it like that in the lounge bar with the wedding cake still on the piano and Teresa still in her wedding dress and confetti everywhere. He knew it was wrong, even before the words came out. He knew that the stout had angered and befuddled him. Sorry, he said. Sorry, Teresa. She shook her head. 
It didn't matter. It was only to be expected that a man you didn't love and who didn't love you would ask a question like that at your wedding celebration. Yes, she said. Yes, he did. He told me, Artie said. I thought he was codding. I wanted to know. It's your baby, Artie. The other thing was years ago. He looked at her. Her face was flushed. Her eyes had tears in them. We had too much stout, he said. They stood where Father Hogan had left them, drawn away from the wedding guests, not knowing where else to look. They looked together at Father Hogan's black back as he left the lounge bar, and then at the perspiring naked heads of Mr. Cornish and Mr. Atty by the bar. At least they had no illusions, she thought. Nothing worse could happen than what had happened already after Father Hogan had laid down the law. She wasn't going to get a shock like Loretta had got. She wasn't going to go sour like Agnes had gone when she discovered that it wasn't enough just to marry a man for a purpose in order to escape from a town. Philomena was convincing herself that she'd fallen in love with an elderly vet. And if she got any encouragement, Kitty Roach would convince herself she was mad about anyone at all. For a moment, as Teresa stood there, the last moment before she left the lounge bar, she felt that she and Artie might make some kind of marriage together because there was nothing that could be destroyed. No magic or anything else. He could ask her the question he had asked while she stood there in her wedding dress. He could ask her and she could truthfully reply because there was nothing special about the occasion or the lounge bar all covered in confetti. Thank you. The, the second story is, is called the, the Piano Tuner's Wives. Violet married the piano tuner when he was a young man. <clears throat> Belle married him when he was old. There was a little more to it than that, because in choosing Violet to be his wife, the piano tuner had rejected Belle which was something everyone remembered when the second wedding was announced. Well, she got the ruins of him anyway, a farmer in the neighborhood remarked, speaking without vindictiveness, stating a fact as he saw it. Others saw it much the same way, though most of them would have put the matter differently. The piano tuner's hair was white, and one of his knees became more arthritic with each damp winter that passed. He had been slender, but was no longer so, and he was blinder than on the day he married Violet, a Thursday in 1951, June the 7th. The shadows he lived among now had less shape and less density than those of 1951. I will, he responded in the small Protestant church of St. Coleman, standing almost exactly as he had stood on that other afternoon. And Belle, in her 59th year, repeated the words her one-time rival had spoken before this altar also. A decent interval had elapsed. No one in the church considered that the memory of Violet had not been honored, that her passing had not been distressfully mourned. And with all my worldly goods, I thee endow, the piano tuner stated, while his new wife thought she would like to be standing beside him in white instead of suitable wine red. 
She had not attended the first wedding, although she had been invited. She had kept herself occupied that day, whitewashing the chicken shed. But even so, she had wept. And, tears or not, she was more beautiful and younger by almost five years than the bride who so vividly occupied her thoughts as she battled with her jealousy. Yet he had preferred Violet, or the prospect of the house that would one day become hers, Belle told herself bitterly in the chicken shed, and the little extra bit of money there was, an easement in a blind man's existence. How understandable, she was reminded later on, whenever she saw Violet guiding him as they walked, whenever she thought of Violet making everything work for him, giving him a life. Well, so could she have. As they left the church, the music was by Bach. The organ played by someone else today, for usually it was his task. Groups formed in the tiny graveyard, which was scattered round the small grey building where the piano tuner's father and mother were buried, with ancestors on his father's side from previous generations. There was to be tea and a few drinks for any of the wedding guests who cared to make the journey to the house two miles away, but some said goodbye now, wishing the pair happiness. The piano tuner shook hands that were familiar to him, seeing in his mental eye faces that his first wife had described for him. It was the depth of summer, as in 1951, the sun warm on his forehead and his cheeks, and on his body through the heavy wedding clothes. All his life he had known this graveyard, at first felt the letters on the stones of the child, spelling out to his mother the names of his father's family. He and Violet had not had children themselves, though they'd have liked to. He was her child, it had been said, a statement that was an irritation for Belle whenever she heard it. She would have given him children. Of that she felt certain. I'm due to visit you next month, the old bridegroom reminded a woman whose hand still lay in his, the possessor of a Steinway, the only one among all the pianos he tuned. She played it beautifully. He asked her to whenever he tuned it, assuring her that to hear was fee enough, but she always insisted on paying what was owing. Monday the 3rd, I think it is, she said. Yes, it is, Julia, Monday the 3rd. She called him Mr. Drumgould. He had a way about him that did not encourage familiarity in others. Often when people spoke of him, he was referred to as the piano tuner. This reminder of his profession reflecting the respect accorded to the possessor of a gift. Owen Francis Drum Gould, his full name was. Well, we had a good day for it, the young clergyman of the parish remarked. They said maybe showers, but sure they got it wrong. The sky... Oh, cloudless, Mr. Drumgool, cloudless. Well, that's nice. And you'll come over to the house, I hope. He must, of course, Bell pressed, then hurried through the gathering in the graveyard to reiterate this invitation, for she was determined to have a party. Some time later, when the new marriage had settled into a routine, people wondered if the piano tuner would begin to think about retiring with a bad knee and being sightless in old age, he would readily have been forgiven in the houses and the convents and the school halls where he applied his skill. Leisure was his due, the good fortune of company as his years slipped by, no more than what he deserved. But when occasionally this was put to him by the loquacious or the inquisitive, he denied that anything of the kind was in his thoughts, that he considered only the visitation of death as bringing any kind of end. The truth was, he would be lost without his work. Without his traveling about, his arrival every six months or so in one of the small towns to which he had offered his services for so long. No, no, he promised. They'd still see the white fox all, turning at a farm gate or parked for half an hour in a convent play yard, or drawn up on a verge while he ate his lunchtime sandwiches, his tea poured out of thermos, by his wife. It was Violet who had brought most of this activity about. 
When they married, he was still living with his mother in the gate lodge of Ballygorm House. He had begun to tune pianos, the two in Ballygorm House, another in the town of Ballygorm, and one in a farmhouse he walked to four miles away. In those days he was a charity because he was blind, and was now and again asked to repair the seagrass seats of stools or chairs, which was an ability he had acquired, or to play at some function or other the violin his mother had bought him in his childhood. But when Violet married him, she changed his life. She moved into the gate lodge, she and his mother not always seen eye to eye, but managing nonetheless. She possessed a car, which meant she could drive him to wherever she discovered a piano, usually long neglected. She drove to houses as far away as 40 miles. She fixed his charges, taking the consumption of petrol and wear and tear to the car into account. Efficiently, she kept an address book and marked in a diary the date of each next tuning. She recorded a considerable improvement in earnings and saw that there was more to be made from the playing of the violin than had hitherto been realised. Country and western evenings in lonely public houses, the crossroads platform dances of the summer, a practice that in 1951 had not entirely died out. Owen Drum Gould delighted in his violin and would play it anywhere, for profit or not. But Violet was keen on the profit. So the first marriage busily progressed. And when eventually Violet inherited her father's house, she took her husband to live there. Once a farmhouse, it was no longer so. The possession of the land that gave it this title, having long ago been lost through a fondness for strong drink that for generations had dogged the family but had not reached Violet herself. Now, tell me what's there, her husband requested often in their early years, and Violet told him about the house she had brought him to, remotely situated on the edge of mountains that were blue in certain lights, standing back a bit from a bend in a lane. She described the nooks in the rooms, the wooden window shutters he could hear her pulling across and latching when wind from the east caused a draught. She described the pattern of the carpet on the single flight of stairs, the blue and white porcelain knobs of the kitchen cupboards, the front door that was never opened. He loved to listen. His mother, who had never entirely come to terms with his affliction, had been impatient. His father, a stable man at Ballygorm House, who died after a fall, he had never known. Lean as a greyhound, Violet described his father from a photograph that remained. And she visualised for him the big, empty, cold hall of Ballygorm House. What we walk around on the way to the stairs is a table with a peacock on it, an enormous silvery bird with bits of coloured glass set in the splay of its wings to represent the splendour of the feathers, greens and blues, she said, when he asked the colour. And yes, she was certain it was only glass, not jewels, because once when he was doing his best with the badly flawed grand in the drawing room, she had been told that. The stairs were on a curve, he knew from going up and down them so often to the piano in the nursery. The first landing was dark as a tunnel, Violet said, and two sofas at either end and rows of unsmiling portraits, half lost in the shadows of the walls. We're passing Ducey's now, Violet would say. Father Feely's getting petrol at the pumps. Esso it was at Ducey's, and he knew how the word was written because he'd asked and been told. Two different colours were employed. The shape of the design had been compared with shapes he could feel. He saw, through Violet's eyes, the gaunt façade of the McCurkey's house on the outskirts of Og Hill. He saw the pallid face of the stationer in Kiliath. He saw his mother's eyes closed in death, her hands crossed on her breast. 
He saw the mountains, blue on some days, misted away to grey on others. A primrose isn't flamboyant, Violet said. More like, more like straw or country butter, with a spot of colour in the middle. And he would nod and know. Soft blue like smoke, she said about the mountains. The spot in the middle, more orange than red. He knew no more about smoke than what she had told him also, but he could tell those sounds. He knew what red was, he insisted, because of the sound. Orange, because you could taste it. He could see red in the SO sign and the orange spot in the primrose. Straw and country butter helped him. And when Violet called Mr. O'Brien gnarled, it was enough. A certain mother superior was austere. Anna Craigie was fanciful about the eyes. Thomas in the sawmills was a streel. Bat Conlon had the forehead of the Merrick's retriever, which was stroked every time the Merrick's broadwood was attended to. Between one woman and the next, the piano tuner had managed without anyone. Fetched by the possessors of pianos and driven to their houses, assisted in his shopping and his housekeeping. He felt he had become a nuisance to people and knew that Violet would not have wanted that. Nor would she have wanted the business she built up for him to be neglected, simply because she was no longer there. She was proud that he played the organ in St. Coleman's Church. Don't ever stop doing that, she said, some time before she whispered her last few words. And so he went alone to the church. It was on a Sunday, when two years almost had passed, that the romance with Belle began. Since the time of her rejection, Belle had been unable to shake off her jealousy, resentful because she had looks and Violet hadn't. Bitter because it seemed to her that the punishment of blindness was a punishment for her too. For what else but a punishment could you call the dark the sightless lived in? And what else but a punishment was it that darkness should be thrown over her beauty? Yet there had been no sin to punish. And they would have been a handsome couple she and Owen Drumgould. An act of grace it would have been, her beauty given to a man who did not know that it was there. It was because her misfortune did not cease to nag at her that Belle remained unmarried. She assisted her father first and then her brother in the family shop, making out tickets for the clocks and watches that were left in for repair noting the details for the engraving of sports trophies. She served behind the single counter, the Christmas season, her busy time, glassware and weather indicators, the most popular wedding guests, gifts, cigarette lighters and inexpensive jewellery for lesser occasions. In time, clocks and watches required only the fitting of a battery, and so the gift side of the business was expanded. But while that time passed, There was no man in the town who lived up to the one who had been taken from her. Belle had been born about the shop, and when the house and shop became her brother's, she continued to live there. Her brother's children were born, but there was still room for her, and her position in the shop was not usurped. It was she who kept the chickens at the back, who had always been in charge of them, given the responsibility on her 10th birthday. That, too, continued. That she lived with a disappointment had long ago become part of her, had made her what she was for her nieces and her nephew. It was in her eyes, some people noted, even lent her beauty a quality that enhanced it. When the romance began with the man who had once rejected her, her brother and his wife considered She was making a mistake, but did not say so, only laughingly asked if she intended taking the chickens with her. 
That Sunday, they stood talking in the graveyard, and the handful of other parishioners had gone. Come and I'll show you the graves, he said, and led the way, knowing exactly where he was going, stepping onto the grass and feeling the first gravestones with his fingers. His grandmother, he said, on his father's side, and for a moment, Ben wanted to feel the incised letters herself, instead of just looking at them. They both knew, as they moved among the graves, that the parishioners who had gone home were very much aware of the two who had been left behind. On Sunday, ever since Violet's death, he had walked to and from his house, unless it happened to be raining, in which case the man who drove old Mrs. Pertill to church took him home also. Would you like a walk, Belle? he asked when he had shown her the family graves. She said she would. Belle didn't take the chickens with her when she became a wife. She said she'd had enough of chickens. Afterwards, she regretted that, because every time she did anything in the house that had been Violet's, she felt it had been done by Violet before her. When she cut up meat for a stew, standing with the light falling on the board that Violet had used, and on the knife, she felt herself a follower. She diced carrots, hoping that Violet had sliced them. She bought new wooden spoons because Violet had shriveled away. She painted the upright rails of the banisters. She painted the inside of the front door that was never opened. She disposed of the stacks of women's magazines, years old, that she found in an upstairs cupboard. She threw away a frying pan because she considered it unhygienic. She ordered new vinyl for the kitchen floor. But she kept the flower beds at the back weeded, in case anyone coming to the house might say she was letting the place become run down. There was always this dichotomy. What to keep up, what to change. Was she giving in to Violet when she tended her flower beds? Was she giving in to pettiness when she threw away a frying pan and three wooden spoons? Whatever Belle did, she afterwards doubted herself. The dumpy figure of Violet, grey-haired as she had been in the end, her eyes gone small in the plumpness of her face, seemed irritatingly to command. And the unseen husband they shared, softly playing his violin in one room or the other, did not know that Violet had dressed badly, did not know she had thickened and become sloppy, did not know she had been an unclean cook. That Belle was the one who was alive, that she was offered all a man's affection, that she plundered his other woman's possessions and occupied her bedroom and drove her car should have been enough. It should have been everything. But as time went on, it seemed to Belle to be scarcely anything at all. He had become set in ways that had been allowed and hallowed in a marriage of nearly 40 years, that was what was always there. A year after the wedding, as the couple sat one lunchtime in the car, which Bell had drawn into the gateway of a field, he said, you tell me if it was too much for you. Too much, Owen? Driving all over the country, having to get me in and out, having to sit there listening to the tuning. It's not too much. You're good the way of patience, Bell. I don't think I'm good at all. I knew you were in church that Sunday. I could smell the perfume you had on. Even at the organ, I could smell it. I loved you when you let me show you the graves. And I loved you before that, Owen. It's just that I, I don't want to tire you out with all the traipsing about after pianos. I, I, I could let it go, you know. 
He would do that for her, her thought was as he spoke. He wasn't much for a woman, he had said another time, a blind man moving on towards the end of his days. He confessed that when first he wanted to marry her, he hadn't put it to her for more than two years, knowing better than she what she'd be letting herself in for if she said yes. What's that bell look like these days? He had asked Violet a few years ago. And Violet hadn't answered at first. Then apparently she said, Belle still looks a girl. I wouldn't want to stop your work, Owen. It gets me out and about too, you know, more than ever in my life. Down all those avenues to houses I didn't know were there, towns I'd never been to, people I never knew. I, it was restricted before. The word slipped out, but it didn't matter. He did not reply that he understood about restriction, for that was not his style. When they were getting to know one another, after that Sunday by the church, he said he'd often thought of her in her brother's jeweler's shop, putting up the grills over the windows in the evenings and locking the shop door, then going upstairs to sit with her brother's family. When they were married, she told him more how most of the days of her life had been spent, only her chickens her own. Smart in her clothes, Violet had added when she said the woman he'd rejected still looked a girl. There hadn't been any kind of honeymoon, but a few months after he had wondered if travelling about was too much, he took Belle away to a seaside resort where he and Violet had many times spent a week. They stayed in the same boarding house and walked on the long, empty strand and in lanes where larks scuttered in and out of the fuchsia and on the cliffs. They drank in Mally's public house. They lay in autumn sunshine on the dunes. You're good to have thought of it. Belle smiled at him pleased because he wanted her to be happy. She knew it wasn't easy for him. They had come to this place because he knew no other. He was aware before they set out of the complication that might develop in his emotions when they arrived. She had seen that in his face, a stoicism that was there for her. Privately, he bore the guilt of betrayal, stirred up by the smell of the sea and the seaweed. The voices in the boarding house were the voices Violet had heard. For Violet, too, the scent of honeysuckle had lingered into October. I'll tell you what we'll do, he said. When we're back, we'll get you the television. Oh, but you couldn't see. You tell me, Belle. They were walking near the lighthouse on the Cape when he said that. He would have offered the television to Violet, Belle thought. But Violet must have said she wouldn't be bothered with the thing. It would never be turned on, she had probably argued. You only got silliness on it anyway. You're good to me, Belle said instead. Ah, no, no. When they were close enough to the lighthouse, he called out and a man called back from a window. Hold on a minute, the man said. And by the time he opened the door, he must have guessed that the wife he'd known had died. You'll take a drop, he offered when they were inside, when the death and the remarriage, and the remarriage had been mentioned. Whiskey was poured, and Belle felt that the glasses lifted in salutation were an honouring of her, although this was not said. It rained on the way back to the boarding house, the last evening of the holiday. Nice for the winter, he said, as she drove away the next day through rain that didn't cease. The television. It came and was installed, and a few weeks after its arrival, Belle acquired a small sheepdog that a farmer didn't want because it was afraid of sheep. <laughs> the dog the dog became hers and was always called hers. 
She fed it and looked after it. She got it used to travelling with them in the car. She gave it a new name, Maggie, which it became used to in time. But even with the dog and the television, with additions and disposals in the house, with being so sincerely assured that she was loved, with being told she was good, nothing changed for Belle. The woman who for so long had taken her husband's arm, who first had guided him into rooms of houses where he coaxed pianos back to life, still claimed existence. Not as a tiresome ghost, some unforgiving spectre uncertainly there, but as if some part of her had been left in the man she loved. Sensitive in ways that other people weren't, Owen Ramgool continued to sense his second wife's unease. She knew he did. It was why he had offered to give up his work, why he had taken her to Violet's seashore and borne there the guilt of his betrayal, why there was a television set now and a sheepdog. Proudly, he had raised his glass to her in the company of a man who had known Violet. Proudly, he had sat with her in the dining room of the boarding house and in Mally's public house. Belle made herself remember all that. She made herself see the bottle of John Jemison taken from a cupboard in the lighthouse and hear the boarding house voices. He understood. He did his best to comfort her. His affection was in everything he did. But before her, Violet would have told him which leaves were on the turn. Violet would have reported that the tide was going out or coming in. Too late, Belle realized that. Violet had been his blind man's vision. Violet had left her no room to breathe. One day, coming away from the house, it was the most distant they visited. The first time Belle had been there, he said, did you ever see a room as somber as that one? Is it the holy pictures that do it? Belle backed the car and straightened it, then edged it through a gateway that 30 years ago hadn't been made wide enough. Somber, she said, on a lane like a riverbed, steering around the potholes as best she could. We used to wonder, he said, could it be they didn't want anything colourful in the way of a wallpaper, in case it wasn't respectful to the pictures. Belle didn't comment on that. She eased the Vauxhall out onto the tarred road and drove in silence over a stretch of bogland. Vividly, she saw the holy pictures in the room where Mrs. Gregan's piano was. Virgin and child, sacred heart, St. Catherine with her lily, the Virgin on her own, Jesus in glory. They hung against nondescript brown. There were statues on the mantelpiece and on a corner shelf. Mrs. Gregan had brought tea and biscuits to that small, melancholy room, speaking in a hushed tone, as if the holiness demanded that. What pictures? Bill, Bill asked, not turning her head. Although she might have, for there was no other traffic and... The bog road was straight. Aren't the pictures still in there? Holy pictures all over the place, he asked. Belle shook her head. They must have taken them down, he said. What's there then? Belle went a little faster. She said a fox had come from nowhere over to the left. It was standing still, she said, the way foxes do. You want to pull up and watch him, Belle? No. No, he's moved on now. Was it Mrs. Gregan's daughter who used to play that piano? Oh, it was. And she hasn't seen that girl in years. Will you say the holy pictures maybe drove her away? What's on the walls now? A striped paper. And Belle added, there's a photograph of the daughter on the mantelpiece. Sometime later, 
on another day when he referred to one of the sisters of the convent in Mina as having cheeks as flushed as an eating apple. Bell said that that nun was chalky white these days, her face pulled down and sunken. She has an illness, so, he said. Suddenly more confident, not caring what people thought, Bell rooted out Violet's plants from the flower bed at the back and grasped the flower beds over. She told her husband of a change at Ducey's garage. Texaco sold instead of Esso. <laughs> she described the Texaco logo, a big red star, and how the letters of the words were arranged. She avoided stopping at Ducey's in case a conversation took place there. In case Ducey were asked if Esso had let him down or what. Well, no, I wouldn't call it silvery exactly, Bell said about the peacock in the hall at Ballygorm House. If they cleaned it up, I'd say it's brass underneath. Upstairs, the sofas at either end of the landing had new loose covers, bunches of different coloured chrysanthemums on them. Well, no, not lean. I wouldn't call him that. Belle said, with a photograph of her husband's father in her hand. A sturdy face, I'd say. A schoolteacher whose teeth were once described as gusty had false teeth now, less of a mouthful, her smile sedate. Time had apparently drenched the bright white of the McCurdy's facade. Almost a grey, you'd call it now. Forget me not blue, Bell said one day, speaking of the mountains that were blue when the weather brought the colour out. You'd hardly credit it, that bright forget me not blue. And it was never again said in the piano tuner's house that the blue of the mountains was the subtle blue of smoke. Owen Drum Gould had run his fingers over the bark of trees. He could tell the difference in the outline of their leaves. He could tell the thorns of gorse and bramble. He knew birds from their song, dogs from their bark, cats from the touch of them on his legs. There were the letters on the gravestones, the stops of the organ, his violin. He could see red, berries and holly and cotoneaster, he could smell lavender and thyme. All that could not be taken from him. And it didn't matter if overnight the colour had worn off the kitchen knobs. It didn't matter if a china light shade had a crack in it that hadn't been there before. What mattered was damage done to something as fragile as a dream. The wife he had first chosen had dressed drably. From silences and inflection, more than from words, he learnt that now. Her grey hair straggled to her shoulders. Her back was a little humped. He poked his way about. There were two old people when they went out on their rounds, older than they were in their ageless happiness. She wouldn't have hurt a fly. She wasn't the person you could be jealous of. Yet, of course, it was hard on a new wife to be haunted by happiness, to be challenged by the simplicities there had been. He had given himself to two women, he hadn't withdrawn himself from the first. He didn't from the second. Each house that contained a piano brought forth its contradictions. The pearls old Mrs. Pertil wore were opals. The pallid skin of the stationer in Kiliath was freckled. The two lines of oaks above Og Hill were surely beeches. Of course, of course. Owen Drumgould agreed, since it was fair that he should do so. 
Bell could not be blamed for making her claim. And claims could not be made without damage or destruction. Bell would win in the end, because the living always do. And that seemed fair also, since Violet had won in the beginning and had had the better years. Thank you very much.